Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, we are going to start. Uh, first, uh, my name is Safiyar Elmi. I'm an associate professor of security studies at Qatar University. I'll be just moderating or timekeeping, whatever you like. And I want to thank a broken kiss institution uh, for organizing this timely event uh, on the Red Sea and the geopolitics uh, that surrounds it. Uh, in that, I just wanted to say a few words about the format of our discussion tonight. Uh, our presenters will talk about five to seven minutes uh, each, and then uh, after that, uh, I'll ask a couple questions, and then we will share the discussion actually uh, with, with our uh, participants here. I know that all of the participants are male, so I'll give special consideration to women when it comes to the audience. So uh, I assure you that if you want to participate in that. Uh, that said, I just also want to inform you that the event is being webcasted live, so you know you are being watched outside here. <laughs> and conquerors and great powers, great powers, leaders, all of those normally uh, consider the Red Sea as a very important artery for global security and trade. Uh, besides Europe and Asia, the Red Sea connects the link, or, or links uh, great oceans, Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, and so on. And as you all know, that uh, the peoples of the western and the eastern uh, side of the Red Sea are connected culturally, politically, and security-wise. Uh, normally, uh, in the literature, they say it's the geographic proximity and the cultural affinity and the network of security and economics that have linked the, the two regions or the two sides of the, uh, of the sea and, in fact, made it into one. And that said, as for the last many, uh, last at least two to three years, you have seen a lot of actors intervening, uh, coming either closer region or even as far as uh, the other side of the world, intervening and being present militarily and economically. And with that, uh, we have uh, panelists who are going to discuss with us on why uh, all of a sudden the geopolitics has changed. And uh, with, we have three panelists who will cover this. Zach Vertin is a Brookings Fellow, uh, and he has, he, he's also Brookings Fellow Doha, and also the Brookings Institution in Washington. Uh, Zach has been a diplomat. Uh, he worked uh, with the Department of State for some time, and prior to that with Rashid, he worked with the International Crisis Group. Uh, additionally, Rashid Abdi is a senior researcher and consultant in the Horn of Africa. He has written a lot of articles, uh, particularly when he was with the International Crisis Group. And Rashid is well known when it comes to the, uh, 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 I mean, publications and, 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 and discussions on this issue. Dr. Khalid al Jabbar is also a director of the MENA Center for Research and assistant professor of political communication at the Gulf Studies Program at Qatar University. His research focuses on political science, public diplomacy, communication, and international relations. He has published scholarly works in several academic and professional journals, and also he will cover uh, at least the global, as uh, the, the global aspect of the issue. With that, I'm going to start with Zach, who will uh, give us a brief uh, comment on what he thinks, and then we'll go on with that. Thanks, Avery. Can you hear me OK? Um, I just want to echo uh, the thanks here, uh, including uh, personally to the Brookings Doha Center, uh, I think for having the foresight. Uh, I'm grateful to invest in this research uh, a year and a half or more ago. Uh, it's suddenly become uh, very hot and we've got more people interested, uh, but I want to thank Tarek Youssef and Nader Kabani and the whole uh, BDC team uh, for having that foresight. Uh, secondly, I'm going to echo my uh, colleague's statement here that uh, while we have these valued guests up here, we did have two additional contributors tonight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, both of them had to withdraw, and that leaves us uh, with an all-male panel up here. So I just wanted to make note of that, that their contributions will be missed, but also because uh, the BDC, I know, is uh, committed to diversity of views, including gender diversity. Um, with that, I'll move to the Red Sea. Um, 
We really have seen a kind of unprecedented surge uh, in Gulf engagement across the Red Sea and into the Horn of Africa uh, over the last few years. It's sort of been characterized by this mad dash for real estate uh, on the western shore uh, uh, of the Red Sea. Uh, this includes commercial ports, it includes uh, military bases, uh, and a rush really for, for clients, uh, you could say, and for market share. Um, the kind of emerging, uh, what, what some of us will call trans-regional dynamics, are really challenging the boundaries of what we often used to think of as two distinct regions, and still obviously their own characters, uh, but in many ways those boundaries are disappearing, uh, especially as you approach this from the Horn side of things. Uh, and what has emerged is, is what we're calling a kind of Red Sea region. Um, just to, on a personal note, part of the reason I got interested in this uh, topic is because I realized that during my time at the State Department, but also other international institutions, uh, we have uh, Arabists or Middle East experts, and we have Africa experts, and they're not very good at talking to each other. Uh, and I see some nods here because I know this is reflected in your own institutions. Uh, and so part of the goal of this Red Sea research and project is to attempt to straddle that divide. So we have a range of state actors with uh, different kinds of government, uh, different styles uh, of diplomacy, uh, and really different resource envelopes, uh, feeling each other out in this space, uh, and the rules of the game are kind of yet to be written. Um, and that, and I'm sure this will be emphasized here tonight, is one of the defining features of this, uh, these, new these new dynamics, uh, and that is asymmetry, right? You have smaller, uh, more nimble, uh, fast-moving, on some occasions, Gulf states, uh, who have uh, sort of big checkbooks, and they're engaging these far larger, uh, more populous, and uh, much poorer African states. Um, just as a point of orientation for those that are, uh, you know, to put it in context, I think the GCC as a whole has something like uh, 55 million people. Uh, correct me if that's wrong. Uh, but if you double that, you're almost as big as Ethiopia at 110 million. So just in terms of size and scope. So all this means that there is huge opportunity for political and economic integration. We've seen roads, we've seen rail, we've seen energy development, uh, and I am really optimistic about this uh, for integration astride the region. I think it can benefit both sides, uh, but as I'm sure we will talk about at length here, uh, as a kind of first season of Red Sea rivalries, as I call it, uh, has shown, uh, there are also considerable risks. The interventions to date, I think, both positive and negative, uh, we'll talk about in Ethiopia, in Somalia, and Somaliland, uh, in Egypt, uh, in Djibouti, uh, all the way down to Kenya, kind of the whole East African region, uh, have been pretty uh, uh, consequential, and because of the politics of the region, there have been a lot of knock-on effects. Uh, lastly, as Afiari uh, mentioned, uh, beyond the GCC and, and Turkey's engagement, there also is a is a very uh, potent and emerging great power angle to this. Uh, as many of you know, the buzzword, uh, whether you agree with it or not in Washington these days, is great power competition. Uh, and the arrival of the Chinese military uh, in Djibouti, the sort of tiny city-state at the mouth of the Red Sea, uh, has really perked up ears, uh, both in the region, in terms of bilateral relations with the Chinese, uh, but also not least in Washington. So control of the Bab el-Mandeb Strait, this very narrow, 17-mile wide, wide gate at the mouth of the Red Sea. Uh, this is really a global strategic cho check, choke point uh, and the gate through which uh, you know, $700 billion in, in trade annually flows. So with that, I'm just gonna mention uh, a few motivations for this. Why are we seeing uh, Gulf engagement now? What has prompted this new rush? Number one, I'll, I'll mention five things. Number one, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to it and explore. Number one, the, this phenomenon is not unique to the region, but we've obviously seen Gulf states looking to project influence uh, kind of beyond uh, their immediate near abroad. Uh, you, can, you can date this back to the Arab Spring in 2011, uh, to uh, attempts to shape the outcome in Egypt after the transition there, uh, also perceptions of American withdrawal, a uh, lot of reasons for this, right? Desire to shape governments in the region. For some, it's about combating extremism. Uh, for others, about assuring legitimacy. Uh, and in many cases, also about uh, ensuring regime security at home. Uh, the second 
motivation for this. If you go back to 2014, uh, you will see, in particularly, uh, the Saudis and Emiratis uh, looking to deter Iran from establishing uh, a foothold in the Red Sea on their sort of western flank. We can talk about that. Uh, third, kind of in chronological order, uh, is the war in Yemen. Uh, in 2016, you see the Saudi and Emirati coalition uh, looking to establish bases in the Horn of Africa uh, from which to launch uh, air and sea assaults uh, into Yemen. Uh, this means engagement with both Djibouti and Somaliland, but ultimately uh, this not insubstantial base in Eritrea where much of that war has been prosecuted from. Uh, fourth, and you're maybe most familiar with this one, is the GCC feud and the blockade of Qatar, uh, and arguably, as we'll talk about, maybe the most destabilizing in the Horn of Africa, as we see, uh, as in so many other regions, uh, maybe most acutely in the Horn of Africa, uh, we see that feud exported uh, with, with quite considerable impacts in Somalia, as Rashid will talk about, but also uh, today in Sudan and elsewhere. Uh, and lastly, in terms of the motivations, uh, and I would argue, I think this is maybe the most underappreciated. Uh, you have to zoom out and see this in the wider maritime context. Uh, and that is a desire to shape the future of maritime trade. So uh, not surprisingly, uh, I think the Emiratis have been uh, the most assertive in this space, though it's not only them. If you look at the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and you look at tri Chinese trade volume coming from China, uh, through the Red Sea to Europe, et cetera, uh, the straight line goes to Djibouti. It doesn't necessarily go to Jebel Ali port uh, in Dubai, right? And so I think there's been a desire uh, by uh, the UAE and, and by DP World uh, in particular to try to uh, shape the future of maritime trade, to uh, insert their fingers in that future uh, rather than be wholly supplanted by the Chinese or other competitors in the space of 10 years. Um, if you look at, and we did a uh, interactive at Brookings, if you go to the Brookings Doha Center site, you can see uh, a web interactive that shows kind of all of the new uh, port control and bases. Uh, and if you look at that, not one of those ports on their own is a game changer, right? But you piece this all together, this kind of constellation of ports, and what you have is an opportunity to do just that, to shape the future uh, of maritime trade. Um, again, we'll talk about this in more detail. We've seen others in this space, uh, even the Qataris, uh, the Turks to some extent, who, who haven't traditionally uh, had experience uh, managing ports abroad have gotten involved in this game. Um, so I'll leave it there. That's, that's how I kind of see, uh, looking backward, uh, what I, again, I, I, I sort of uh, jokingly call season one of, of the new geopolitics of the Red Sea. And I think uh, as we proceed, we'll, we'll talk about uh, sort of the next season. Thanks. Thank being concise. Rashid, you want to go ahead for your yes. brief comment? Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, may I also take the opportunity to uh, express my appreciation and thanks to Brookings for, for inviting me. Um, the Horn of Africa, as everyone knows, uh, is one of the most unstable corners of, of the globe. Um, historically conflict-prone. Uh, uh, with probably one of the largest uh, human displacement crises in the, in the world, about 70% of uh, you know, the world's global uh, displacement crisis is actually in the Horn. Uh, you have millions of populations that, that have uh, moved across the borders, but also internally, you also have a growing uh, internally displaced uh, persons crisis. Just to give you an example, you know, a country like uh, Ethiopia, for example, now has uh, close to two million of its own population internally displaced. And that tells you a great deal about how unstable uh, this part of the world is. And I think um, uh, the, apart from this displacement uh, crisis, you also have transitions that are contested, uh, transitions that are highly sh uh, unstable, uh, I will take that example as, as actually, uh, you know, a country like Ethiopia, the transition underway in Ethiopia, but also the one underway in, in South Sudan. Uh, we have seen some positive momentum in Sudan, but also uh, no one can, can say with any certainty that these transitions would actually uh, be what they are in the next uh, five to six years. In other words, there is a, a, a well-established pattern of transitions always leading to other transitions, not ending uh, highly uh, uh, fluid and, and very unstable uh, situations. 
Uh, another, I think, uh, phenomenon that is worth uh, highlighting uh, before we even talk about the, the impact of the spillover is how dangerously unstable the Horn is in terms of the conflict uh, landscape and the conflict dynamics. Conflicts are no longer between the states, between its, uh, you know, the era of large scale uh, border wars have ended. But what you have is actually proliferation of conflicts internally within countries. And conflicts are becoming also fragmented. Uh, take the example of, of South Sudan, which uh, uh, Zach knows a great deal about. You now have dozens of armed uh, groups uh, which are all uh, competing to carve out territories within South Sudan itself. So the, the picture of, of the Horn of Africa um, hasn't changed substantially despite all what you hear in the media about a rising horn and uh, a new positive energy with the emergence of uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe. The Horn of Africa remains historically conflict uh, pr prone, very unstable, and also very vulnerable. Now, the impact of the Gulf crisis has been very much acute in Somalia. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Historically, it's a Muslim country with long historical tradition of, of, of relationship with the, with the Horn, uh, with the Gulf. Um, over the years, it has maintained that very close relationship. Then I think partly as a function of the instability in Somalia, you also have a political class that has forged very close links with the Arab world, that relies on the Arab world for funding, for, you know, for uh, basically also diplomatic and political support. Um, so when this Gulf crisis uh, spilled over, when the rivalries spilled over into the Horn of Africa, uh, Somalia became caught up in this, in this very vicious struggle between the Emiratis and the Qataris with the, with the political elite in, in Mogadishu choosing which side to support. So you had a fragmentation of the political elite and that overlapped or uh, in some ways uh, magnified also the bigger um, problem which was Somalia has been experimenting with a decentralized system of government. But this system was not perfect and all of a sudden because of this rivalry it became caught up in these very core periphery tensions which intensified and escalated with Somalia's federal member states choosing which sides uh, to support. While Mogadishu was very supportive of, of the Qatari um, diplomacy, you had the regional governments actually choosing to side with the Emiratis. And then you had this massive escalation between the Emirati government and the Somalis, which led to actually the, the Emiratis folding up their tent in Mogadishu and abandoning the country. That doesn't mean that the Emiratis have washed their hands off uh, Somalia. Um, many people actually expect uh, that in the looming electoral cycle, we will begin to see the Emiratis engaging very heavily and becoming much more involved uh, in really uh, you know, hand-picking or picking which side uh, to support in the Somalia electoral process. But just to suffice to say that it, the impact of the crisis hasn't been only acutely felt, felt in, in, in Somalia, uh, but also we have seen that impact uh, extend to places like uh, you know, Ethiopia, where the current president, uh, the prime minister, has been perceived to be very closely allied uh, to the Arab Gulf. Uh, and that has also caused some tensions within, within Ethiopia. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask your permission to speak in Arabic since we are in Qatar, and I think this is part of the law as well, to adopt the Arabic language. I would like to extend my thanks to the BDC, Doha, Brookings Center. So for a decade, it is a kind of a beacon whereby we discuss many matters of the Middle East. So we have seen that there is a rethinking about this center in the Middle East. And we would like that the efforts are going to continue by Brookings and other uh, centers as well.
and to uh, shine light on issues and matters in the Middle East. As my colleagues have said, I do not want to repeat what my colleagues have just said, but I would like to tell you that there is a story. So when we talk about the Horn of Africa, and this story represents a problematic, uh, and the historical pathway of this problematic is very important indeed, uh, and perhaps this would enable us to open certain doors for us to be able to know how we can explain what is happening on the ground there. So by coincidence, I happened to be in Washington and I had the opportunity to visit the African Museum in Washington. And I wanted really to visit that museum and I had the opportunity to read and to know the narrative that had led the to so many people from Africa who came from Africa to the United States of America. And also, I saw one of my friends who came to visit us also, and I went to one of the museums in Qatar, which is Bin Jalmud Museum. And for the first time, I saw another story, a story which is linked uh, hugely to Africa, particularly linked to the Horn of Africa. So perhaps these stories uh, are in some point or in some place uh, in the GCC history, even when it comes uh, to the impact of Africa on our songs, on our dances. These kinds of points are not very much the center of attention. They were always put at some kind of margin. So these stories that have seen light, that reformulate relations as a result of the information that we get to know. So when we go back to the formation of the states in the Horn of Africa, I think it started, the relationship started with some GCC countries. We have seen some embassy that have been opened by GCC countries in countries of the Horn of Africa. So. That is why we have seen the most important case in the 50s and the 60s uh, when there was uh, a conflict between Arabs uh, and Israel and uh, this has led uh, to a change in the equation after the deal of the century and after that we have seen that uh, the relationship has become of a charitable kind of nature. So. Uh, and with the transformations that we have seen in the region, with the Iranian revolution and the changes that we have seen in the GCC, we have seen the rise of an ideological conflict in Africa between Sunnis and Shiites. And unfortunately, that the extremist uh, uh, edition or formula was adopted by so many groups uh, and so many people who have adopted this kind of formula and have started implementing it. We have heard in recent uh, years, uh, uh, groups such as Boko Haram and other political groups in the political scene in Africa. So we had religious ideologies and also we have come to the end of the 80s and the 90s and also the aid that was given by GCC countries to certain African countries uh, for them to get some allegiances in certain uh, political directions and also transforming these uh, uh, forms of aid into investments and also entering into agriculture. And after that, we have seen investments in ports, uh, particularly in the Horn of Africa and in the different islands and the extended areas and territories where GCC countries can invest. So they started investing in that particular era of time and the Emirates was one of the first countries that did that. And after that, we have seen many political agendas rising to the surface as well. So we should not also forget about the role of media, Al Jazeera Network, particularly the English version contributed a great deal when it comes to the discussion of so many African matters, whether in the GCC or at the level of the region or internationally speaking. Perhaps the problematic that we are living today, it has to do with buying allegiances and also 
political alignments. And the most important example that we live, whether here in the GCC, particularly after the division that we have seen as a result of the GCC crisis in 2017, and the position vis-a-vis -vis African countries in the Horn of Africa and in general, perhaps Eritrea and Djibouti were witnesses to this particular phase. And we have seen their positions whereby they supported the different countries, the blockading countries, uh, the countries that conducted an air and land and sea blockade on the state of Qatar. There was a kind of uh, change of uh, pathways uh, with time and uh, but the division the rift the differences still exist between these countries we do see this division if we try to track what has happened there is a political division there is an economic division religious division social division and rift and the intention based on which the rich countries carried out their projects was based on a number of alignments that are inimical to African countries and also has an impact on GCC countries themselves because the leaders, the political parties, the groups had to choose, were forced to choose which country, which side they're going to be loyal to. Are they going to have political loyalty or financial loyalty. So which country to side with? This is manifested very clearly now after the crisis. I would like to conclude and I would like to say that African countries now take part in the GCC crisis. And perhaps the battlefield, the main one, is uh, Yemen. We have seen soldiers from Sudan, from many African countries. We've seen families sending their sons to be killed on Yemeni territories. So these are the main issues that we are facing, whether in the Horn of Africa or in the GCC. And we cannot deal with this matter for the time being rationally. I actually published an article titled Six Bloodlines to Watch. Can you outline this for us? What, uh, what do you mean by this? Um, sure. I think, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I guess my original comments were about how we got here, uh, the motivations, um, and I think um, actually the kind of intensive uh, push, uh, as has been alluded to here, uh, into the a African continent and specifically into the Horn uh, has slowed a bit in recent months. Um, and I think uh, some of the actors that have been most engaged uh, from the Gulf are sort of stepping back, uh, assessing their interventions to date, uh, taking survey of an altered land and seascape, uh, and thinking about what's next. Um, in terms of those things that I think will shape uh, this in the coming months and years and, and potentially beyond. Um, a few have been alluded to here. Uh, first, again, is the war in Yemen. Um, uh, after a sort of lull in fighting uh, late in 2019 and some optimism about negotiations, um, we've seen backsliding there. So what the political end game looks like there, um, I think, but also the territorial considerations. Uh, I mentioned the constellation or uh, the the kind of scramble for ports all over the region. Uh, this is not only about the western shores of the African coast, uh, or of the Red Sea, excuse me, on the African coast, it's also about the entire south coast of Yemen. So you look dur during the war in Yemen to date, uh, control of those ports, uh, as you know, not only Hodeida, but other uh, but other ports um, is about that future of maritime trade. So I think uh, not to, something not to lose sight of. Um, second is the coming elections in Somalia. Uh, if they'll happen this year, we'll let Rashid uh, take that gamble. Um, he mentioned this kind of destabilization that happened there uh, in recent years. I think the question going into these elections is, uh, will we a again have a external bidding war uh, where external uh, actors are, are choosing clients and helping to uh, fuel uh, or, or cash fuel uh, another election as we've seen in the past in Somalia. 
Uh, third, and I'll just intro these because I think we should probably talk about them uh, more, uh, are the political transitions both in Sudan, as Rashid mentioned, and in Ethiopia. Uh, this is a big deal. <laughs> The, the transitions underway in both of those countries, uh, together 140 million plus people, uh, will be the catalyst uh, for uh, advancement in the region and, and to make it a success story, or they will be the downfall, one or the other. And it, at the moment, is a, is a, a, a tightrope sort of exercise. Um, we've seen Gulf engagement uh, play a big role in both, uh, both uh, uh, a desire to help mediate in, in Ethiopia and Eritrea, uh, though if you want to hear more about that, co come back to us in questions. Uh, whether or not that do deal was brokered from the outside or was motivated by domestic Ethiopian politics, uh, I think is slightly different than has been pre presented in the public space. Um, but also an injection of cash from Gulf states at a really critical moment early in uh, the new prime minister and Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, Abiy Ahmed's tenure. Uh, so that transition is uh, incredibly uh, fragile at the moment and incredibly important for the entire horn. Ethiopia is the linchpin of the entire region, which is also why we've seen uh, so much Gulf engagement, particularly there. Uh, because it's about developing roads and rail and ports in one of the least connected regions, uh, but it's also about gaining access to 110 million new consumers in what, until recently, has been a comparatively closed society and definitely a closed economy uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, Sudan, also a, a really landmark transition underway there. Uh, we all have our fingers crossed there's been outsized Gulf engagement again to date, uh, both on the positive and the negative side of the ledger. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, if you want, and it has involved uh, all the Gulf actors, uh, maybe the most recent uh, geopolitical chess piece in this wider game that my colleagues have referred to. Uh, fourth, uh, going forward, um, and I just happen to have a prop right up here. We put out a, a report from the Brookings Doha Center uh, on this idea of a Red Sea Forum. This came out in November, uh, but there have been various efforts, uh, first from outside the region, from interested European states, uh, from Gulf states, and, and from uh, the African side of the continent as well, to try to establish some kind of multilateral mechanism, right? We've talked about this clash of different kinds of governments and all this new engagement and the opportunity there, uh, but as I mentioned, the rules of the game are yet to be written. So is there at least uh, a body where where these states can get together, uh, go in advance, shared agenda about development, about energy, about infrastructure, about migration. We haven't said migration yet. Enormous between these two regions. Mm -hmm. Enormous in both directions, uh, both because of conflict, but also because of economic opportunity. Uh, fifth, in terms of the narratives I think are worth watching, um, is the intra-Gulf rivalry. And this obviously uh, is about the, the blockade and the feud uh, uh, between Qatar and its neighbors uh, and the Egyptians, but it's also uh, obviously about the escalated situation in Iran. Uh, and that, that uh, plays out not only in the Strait of Hormuz, but in the Gulf of Oman and into the Red Sea. You will, if you're paying attention, you will have seen that IRGC commanders have also name-checked uh, the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandeb uh, as a potential target in this wider uh, game. Third, in terms of uh, the intra-Gulf rivalries, I think also it's worth paying attention. Uh, we very often over in recent years have kind of lumped Saudi Arabia and the UAE in, together in one category. And if you go to both of those capitals now, you'll hear uh, what we might in Washington call a policy review. Uh, that uh, I don't think that relationship is going anywhere, uh, but I think because of different threat perceptions around the region, whether or not that's uh, Iran or political Islam uh, and the Brotherhood, uh, whether that's over divergent strategies in Yemen, whether that's about global reputations, um, or ultimately, I think if you look longer term about economic competition uh, among GCC states, including uh, those two. So I think uh, that will uh, look different uh, in, in the period to come. Uh, sixth is China. Uh, I've alluded to it, but both the, the economic presence, which is felt all across the GCC, of course, uh, but especially in the Horn of Africa. And then I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat because that was my sixth plot line. I'm going to add a seventh. 
uh, and that is the Nile water negotiations, which you know have, have come back to the fore again and are a major, major uh, sticking point, a major, major source of, of tension between uh, Egypt and Ethiopia. Those talks have recently broken down, uh, but watch this space because everything in the horn and everything uh, related to the sort of complex web of relationships between these two sides of the Red Sea uh, is in one way or another tied up in those negotiations as well. Sorry, okay, sorry just, for cheating. Uh, just, uh I want to tell you on the Red Sea Forum creation. In fact, the politics of creating that regional organization has uh, shown even all of those aspects that you have mentioned, including the Nile aspect. Can you elaborate on who is excluded, who is included in this forum, the contentious issues? Uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, the idea is, uh, in the best case scenario, you can have a forum where these states can come together uh, and talk about uh, migration, as I said, about labor flows, uh, about conflict resolution, about uh, energy and infrastructure development. Uh, at a minimum, you have some kind of multilateral forum uh, that can prevent some of the destabilization we've had, right? Uh, uh, to sort of act as a deterrent against any single actor kind of running amok in this region. Uh, so I, 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 for one, think it's a good idea. Uh, over the course of the last year, there have been debates in multiple regions about this. What does it look like? What are its objectives? And as you allude to, uh, maybe most uh, controversially, who is included? So. Uh, you will have maybe noticed uh, last month uh, a kind of Saudi-led initiative. Uh, in fact, a partnership really between uh, the Saudis and the Egyptians was formalized. The Red Sea Council uh, for short was formed and it includes the littoral states uh, of the Red Sea, right? Strictly those with a coastline. Um, we can get into the details about why. Uh, uh, I think there is, fortunately, the door is open now, and I would encourage those uh, diplomats in the room who are uh, supportive of this effort uh, to make a push now about expanding this organization. What are its objectives? Uh, and especially, uh, how do we include others in the room, right? There are other GCC states uh, that, if they're not full members, have something to contribute. Uh, on the African side, the obvious one is Ethiopia. Ethiopia is about 30 miles from the Red Sea, but are, at the moment is excluded from this uh, organization. Uh, you may read something about Egypt into that uh, if you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what about the other side of the sea? Uh, Me again? There is, uh, no, I'm going <laughs> to go to Rashid, but there is another exclusion as well on Israel and, 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 and what happens. And if you look at the GDP and per capita and everything, you cannot ignore. How, how, how do you go with it? Ignore Israel? Yep. Yeah, uh, thanks for the easy one. Um, I think that's tricky. There was a question in the beginning about, uh, you know, whether Israel or even Jordan would be uh, a member given very small uh, yes. coastline. I don't have any special insight. Uh, I think uh, I haven't heard the Israelis uh, make a lot of noise about this to date um, or, or clamoring to be involved. Uh, they haven't really been part of the discussion. It hasn't been a major issue. Uh, whether or not, uh, as we expand the format, hopefully you have the littoral states, you have kind of uh, ideally a, a forum that can engage neighborhood states uh, and outside power. So not only Israel, but uh, the Americans, the Chinese, the European Union, which has huge trade interests that go through this region. So okay. the question uh, we'll, is... We'll come back to that. Okay. Rashid, as you know, uh, even prior to the Yemen war, there has been diversification motive where the Gulf sta states went to Africa, so-called acro investments in Ethiopia and, and Sudan. And you know, the Oromo uprising and all of these things were linked to the uh, so-called land grab and all of these issues. Uh, so with that impact and later on what has happened, what do you make of it and what, what Zach has just raised? Zach has, has covered a lot of ground on um, the ways in which the Gulf uh, uh, geopolitical rivalries have had an impact on the broader Red Sea. Um, there is no doubt, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, what you hinted at is, remains very valid, that uh, a lot of the uh, geopolitical, the rise actually of, of many of these middle powers uh, stems from a very acute economic need which is a post-oil future. 
And uh, I think during my conversations with many of the Arab, uh, many of the Middle Eastern actors, the sense I get is that they want to translate the money which they have now in their, in their reserve and the money which they now have in their uh, sovereign funds to make use of it. And I think um, because uh, historically um, the Horn of Africa remains one of, is actually very close to the Gulf, and also a country like Ethiopia, uh, has one of the largest uh, water resources uh, of the whole of Africa. You know, they, they, they call uh, Ethiopia the water tower of Africa. Um, and potentially this is an agricultural powerhouse. And the Saudis for many years have been eyeing a lot of agricultural investment. They do have a big agricultural, a uh, big rice plantation, uh, you know, uh, in, in Gambella, but also the Saudis are very keenly invested in the idea of uh, Ethiopia becoming the breadbasket of the Arab world. And this has been something even that predates the Gulf crisis and the Gulf rivalries. Now, uh, Qatar is, an, is a new actor in all this um, economic, I think, argument. But uh, what struck me very uh, most is, I will tell you an anecdote. Two years ago, I went to Kigali, which is the capital of uh, Rwanda. And I went to this uh, nice hotel uh, slash conference, uh, international conference facility called the Kigali International uh, Conference Center. And I was, at that time when I was there, the Emirati uh, uh, Dubai Potswald had taken over the entire second floor of the building. And I inquired why Dubai Port would be interested in uh, you know, basically putting up shop in, in, Rwanda, in Rwanda, Kigali. There is no port in Kigali. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering what is the geopolitical calculations. And it only emerged to me later why the Emiratis have built this strategic partnership with Rwanda. Rwanda is an emergent economy, very efficient uh, country that is well run, uh, also a rising uh, potentially uh, middle economy power in Central Africa. Um, and the Emirates are also very much also invested in the gold trade in the Congo. Uh, so there is a particular reason why the Emirates want a presence in Kigali. But then there is also other bigger calculation, which is that, and this goes back to, if, if, you, if you look at the history of geopolitics, there is always a link between Pots and Hinterland. Uh, when um, the, when they, the, the, Brit the British wanted to colonize East Africa. They were not interested in Kenya. They wanted the pearl of Africa, which is Uganda. But then they had to build the railway. And when they, to build the railway, they needed also a port. So they, they, they were interested in Mombasa. And, and so that same calculation is going on uh, with some of these, uh, I think, economic geopolitical calculations. The, the, the Emirates are basically saying that if, if we control Pots, then we need markets. We need an economy to support those pots. And so there is this now thinking that they need these anchor states. And Rwanda is an anchor state for the Emirates, for what, they, what is called the hinterland economy, which has to be linked with this broader uh, uh, you know, constellation of pots along the east, uh, east coast of Africa. So, um, I think you need to be a student of geopolitics to understand that what is going on today isn't any different from the bigger, the older geopolitical calculations that were made uh, in the earlier years. Now, definitely the economic um, aspect is a key driver of this. The military uh, you know, aspect, which Zach hinted at, is, is, is also there. Uh, there. There has been a massive increase in the number of uh, footprints, uh, you know, Gulf, military footprints in the, in the, in the Red Sea. When, when you look yeah. at the intervention now, it, yeah. it wasn't all negative, right? Yeah. There were at least some positive aspects Absolutely. of it, particularly yeah. the peace. So can you just elaborate on what, what came with this yes. uh, great interest? Exactly. From and I our think, neighbors uh, in the other side? Uh, you anticipated uh, where I was headed. I, I don't think we, we, we should be extremely bleak and pessimistic about this Gulf uh, spillover, because uh, when you look at the media and you look at, there's a lot of simplification which is going on, and a perception that all this is destabilizing and driving conflicts. But if you look at just one example, which is 
Eritrea and Ethiopia would not have been at least at peace today if it wasn't for the, for the positive impact which the Gulf uh, rivalry has had. The Emiratis and the Saudis went swiftly and basically pushed these two countries to make peace. Now, let's admit it, this peace is very fragile. It has not been institutionalized. There isn't a document to which you can hold all the parties and say, this is what you signed, none of them. So it's actually very dependent on two individuals, Abi and Afewerki, and also the goodwill of two major powers, the Emiratis and the Saudis. Now, three, four years down the line, there has to be, a, there has to be progress. There has to be something on the table, and we haven't seen that. So just to go back to the question which you raised, there is real potential of this major interest by Gulf uh, powers to have actually positive, uh, moment, positive um, outcomes in the Horn of Africa. Also, just to give you another example, the Qatari uh, uh, petroleum and gas went and bought um, some, some uh, you know, facilities mm -hmm. uh, or some, some stakes mm -hmm. in the Kenyan uh, offshore oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Now, Qatar has a lot of leverage over both Somalia and also Kenya. And I'm told that uh, in the last one year, the Qataris have been extremely um, um, you know, involved in trying to mediate and broker some form of a settlement between the Kenyans and uh, the Somalis. And that is, for me, another example of actually the Gulf using its leverage, not to, not to inflame conflicts, but also to, to, do the complete, uh, to do the opposite, which is to bring countries uh, you know, together and, and resolve some of these uh, regional tensions. So um, I think I've, I've talked yep, broadly. I think I'll uh, yes, we'll, we'll just stop there yeah, and then we'll yeah. get back okay. to it. Dr. Khalid, can you, this, can you bring this into the Gulf perspective? You can see uh, a lot of the time people are saying that the intervention coming from the eastern side is not that good at all. So what do you take? If we look into... Looking to the image in a larger uh, uh, angle, we can see that we have been... 10 years since the end of uh, the uh, Arab uh, stability and especially uh, our entry into this what's called the, the uh, between brackets the Arab Spring stage in fact if the, what's ironic today is that yesterday the former Egyptian president uh, Hussein Barak died he was one of the victims of these Arab uh, revolutions that began in Tunisia and went on. And its uh, uh, effects have reached uh, the, even the Gulf states. Uh, some countries like Bahrain uh, uh, is, is had the witnesses which are is big compared to Emirates or Qatar. After the Arabic uh, Spring went into a revolution and a counter-revolution, the Arab countries uh, 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 went along with these revolutions uh, and in the belief that there should be changes. That, In fact, that should take place in the Arab world, who has stayed for about 60 years, uh, stable without any changes, neither in politics nor in economics. Uh, there was no real openness uh, on the civil society. There were no, no real uh, freedoms, liberties, for uh, compared to those uh, who live in the region, as Israel, for example, or in Turkey, or even if we compare them to the people who live in European countries or USA or Australia. In addition to other countries uh, who had not had did not go on this in this line, and uh, but took another path, uh, a path in uh, believing that uh, the status quo should continue, uh, so they tried to buy time uh, to, to extend this stage, uh, stage to long as long as possible uh, to get, to maintain the status quo. But this has also affected the conflicts in the, of the, in the, the of the Gulf states. Had uh, also affected the Horn, Corn of Africa countries, and many of the uh, support, economic uh, support, was linked to conditions of supporting some groups or governments or, or to overlook some uh, the social or economic demands. Even the countries, when they give. Uh, uh, 
uh, aid to some other countries, they did not put conditions as did the, the Western countries about democracy or, uh, or that there is a minimum level of uh, respecting human rights and uh, fair wages. This was not something that uh, the, do, uh, some of the GCC countries uh, took uh, into consideration. Uh, they only focused on their leverage, their expansion of influence, and obtaining allegiances and, uh, from these African countries. And we, for the biggest conflict was in Somalia, for example. Qatar, for example, supported the legitimate government, and maybe this is also similar to, to Libya, while the other GC countries, especially the Emirates, uh, uh, supported the regions, uh, and the conflict continues in these countries uh, in one way or the other. And also, there's this problematic between the GC countries that led that to a bigger or more uh, conflict with the presence of Iran and is entering the political landscape, uh, and also no one speaks about what's happening in Yemen, how that the Iran is supporting the Houthis and sending them uh, weapons, uh, and uh, also targeting some economic and even military uh, targets. There's also the entry of another player on the regional level, which is Turkey which also had her, their, have their own or different agenda. And if you enlarge that image, China before that, uh, we know how many investments it has made, and uh, my colleagues they refer to that. Uh, I think also there's also a, 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 a Gulf uh, way of thinking to go along with this idea of the Silk Road and to, to have for their own uh, 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 interest which might not be uh, uh, I, w I would and as can you can you explain a bit more on the rift the, the impact of the rift uh, between the Gulf states on Sudan in general and also how this <coughs> eventually will shape uh, the Horn of Africa uh, or the African side of things <laughs> Sudan was the last example that we have all observed when it comes to the changes and transformations that have happened after President al-Bashir. We have seen the conflicts of interest in the presence of a government that was still undertaking the same old methodology and a government that does not want to change. So to open up on popular options this was reflected in the media as well. So we have seen Al Jazeera Network and how it covered the, what had happened, how it covered the demands of the people on the ground in comparison with other Arab networks such as Sky News uh, that uh, follows uh, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. We have seen how their coverage was different uh, when it comes to the support that was given to the military council. So we have seen the entry of the international community, and we hope that the international community would play a larger role when it comes to what is happening. I'm not saying that they need to limit their power, but at least to preserve the political game because we do not want a state to hijack the political situation because the repercussions that we see on the ground entail that everybody is suffering, whether those who live in the Horn of Africa and those who suffer from the differences of agendas in the GCC countries. Unfortunately, the GCC crisis impacted everybody. So the latest developments that we have seen uh, it is clear they are going to spill over and the options uh, uh, that are undertaken by the GCC countries, perhaps they are not in conformity with the interests of others. And this is also going to uh, make the crisis be protracted. And also the crisis in Yemen is also impacting uh, African countries. We have uh, Sudanese soldiers on the ground in Yemen fighting, and we have seen so many victims that have fallen as a result of that. Why do they take part in such a war? There are, there are economic incentives. There is money that is being paid as a result of that. But consequently, 
the Sudanese agenda. I think it is not in keeping with the GCC agendas. Uh, so that is why having the international community in order to control this political game, this is something that we are all aiming to achieve. The priority to the uh, ladies. So if any of you want to ask question, Yep. Okay, uh, my name is Mansoor. Uh, I just wanted to start uh, um, to, to recall what the, uh, the speaker said. So we, we will have three questions and then the audience will answer. So go ahead. God, okay. I, uh, I just, I mean, first uh, remark uh, the late. Uh, Professor, the Kenyan professor Ali Mazroi, he have a very uh, famous firm, uh, uh, term saying uh, uh, Afrobia, if I pronounce it correctly. He talked about the, you know, the connections between Horn of Africa or Africa, the East African and the uh, Arabian Peninsula. But, but it, I mean, I still think that um, despite of the latest development we see the, about the geopolitics, but there's no uh, uh, people to peoples or, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, studies being uh, uh, published in that area. So if you have any uh, recommendations about that. Uh, I wanted to bring to uh, Rashid, um, uh, he was saying that the Gulf uh, countries uh, involvement in Horn of Africa can be, I mean, he look at it as to be uh, positive. But when, when, when you look at uh, you know, some of their, at, at their interventions, uh, I mean, UAE, for example, um, they, uh, had the, uh, they had an agreement with the Eritrean government uh, uh, and uh, signed a secret agreement. We don't know the details. The Eritrean people, they don't know the details of you know, leasing uh, uh, the port of Assab. To, to Emirates, I don't know, for 100 years, nobody knows. Uh, it's a dictatorship uh, uh, government. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of, I mean, the uh, in, indigenous people of Afari people there, uh, there's a lot of report talking about, you know, even, uh, yeah. you know, ethnic yeah. cleansing. Any, any question? Okay, question. Qu questions. How can, how can that kind of, uh, you know, uh, intervention be a positive? Uh, uh, the same thing in Somalia, uh, uh, to sign uh, agreement with regional states without the, you know, uh, uh, going to the uh, uh, internationally recognized government of Mogadishu, how that can be positive. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. And then that, three questions, so go ahead. The Djibouti representative. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Zahra Hassan, Sharjah Affair, the Djibouti Embassy. Thank you for hosting this uh, event. Uh, um, it's lots of, I bring lots of uh, enrichment on, in Horn on Africa and Red Sea. Uh, and that, um, uh, my question is. Uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to bring some uh, issues and uh, uh, ask uh, some clarification and an issue between the uh, in Horn Africa, uh, especially Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, and last meeting in uh, last meeting uh, in Ethiopia between Somalia and Somaliland, uh, where it's going there, and also between Djibouti and Eritrea, since um, they shake hands, uh, say, say, and our president uh, in 2018. Uh, okay. As you mentioned area, earlier, like, like uh, there was nothing signed, but just checking if there's any uh, enclosed. And thank you. Okay. Uh, before I just come back, go, go, go ahead. Yeah. Hey. I promise I'm gonna come to you, so. Assalamu alaikum, uh, good evening, uh, guest. 
Um, I would like to ask you how the GCC crisis would impact in the future uh, Qatar's economy. Okay, we have those three questions. So you want to start, Rashid? Yes, um, a number of questions have been put uh, specifically for me, I think. Uh, one, of course, is the, the future of the Ethiopia-Eritrea uh, peace process. Um, I think there is no doubt, let's not uh, downplay the significance of what has happened in the last one year. Uh, two countries that have been at war for over 20 years, that fought the bloodiest conflict in modern times in Africa, where close to half a million people died, for the first time, I think, met face to face, engaged routinely, and agreed to make peace. So there is no detracting from the fact that what Prime Minister Abiy achieved, and I think what also underpinned his Nobel Prize victory is largely the fact that he, he managed to uh, I think achieve that uh, negotiation, that uh, rapprochement. But where the problem lies is that Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea is a very autocratic state, uh, led essentially by one man. Uh, a key driver of the migration crisis, where uh, you know, at any one point in a year, tens of thousands of young people are leaving the country. Some of them dying in the Mediterranean, others dying in, 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 the, in the Indian Ocean. So it is a huge, it is a highly unstable country. Dependent, I think the control will definitely disappear the day, uh, you know, uh, the current uh, president leaves the scene. So having a peace treaty largely uh, based on gentlemanly agreement, I think is not a way to achieve peace. Uh, on this other side, uh, Ethiopia has real serious problems internally. One of the reasons actually why Prime Minister Abi uh, went and forged this very speedy uh, rapprochement with Eritrea was partly, uh, partly informed by the situation in Tigray. Tigray is a province which borders uh, uh, Eritrea and was actually one of the areas that was closely involved with the years of conflict. Now, people say that, and I think it, it, it could be true, that part of the calculation by Abi and Feworki was to neutralize the Tigrayans. So Tigray today has become a sort of mini state which has drifted very far away from, from uh, the control of Addis. It's also heavily armed. Um, also has a long historic tradition of uh, guerrilla struggle. And the prospect for actually a conflict between the Tigray, between Tigray region and the rest of Ethiopia is also very real. Uh, Ethiopia's um, progress in stabilizing the country has not been that encouraging. Uh, as I hinted earlier, uh, conflicts have, have proliferated, so there is a huge um, um, fragmentation of the, uh, you know, the uh, conflict landscape, whereby you, you are beginning to see ethno-nationalist uh, sentiments beginning to emerge. The Oromo uh, nation is deeply divided. Um, you are now heading into an election in August 29th. Um, the opposition parties are not very happy with the electoral timeline. So Ethiopia is highly unstable, and uh, as my colleague uh, Zach has hinted at, a lot depends on the progress which, we make, which Ethiopia makes in the, in the next one year. If Ethiopia succeeds in uh, overcoming, first of all, the electoral calendar where you have an election modestly successful, and then an outcome which is not contested, or is contested but does not destabilize the country, then Ethiopia has a future and there is a prospect uh, for peace within the wider region. My fear is that a lot of uncertainty is largely based on Abiy's calculation. Uh, people are beginning to wonder whether there is real strategic thinking behind many of his, his uh, policies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Khalid, on the GCC impact uh, on Africa, do you want to comment on? 
perhaps my colleagues have uh, talked at great length about so many of the cases that have been posed. I would like also to talk about some of the factors that have uh, contributed to the division. Why some GCC countries undertake uh, adventures, big adventures in the Horn of Africa. I think what has happened in recent years, uh, such as uh, the fact that the United States of America revisited its view towards the v GCC and the equation of uh, oil for protection is being revisited as well. The United States of America does not need oil and it is not ready to sacrifice with its own men for the GCC. So the political vacuum and uh, also the view from the United States of America to redraw its uh, view about the GCC and also so many other things such as uh, trying to open up towards Asia and so on and so forth has led to what is happening now. So now the United States of America and the GCC, they try to have new allies uh, through investments. That is why we find so many GCC countries trying to buy new loyalties from the Horn of Africa when it comes to this crisis, to this problematic. If we go back again to the United States of America, we can also talk about the confrontation with Iran and the risk posed by Iran. So the former uh, administration, American administration, concluded the uh, deal with Iran, but the current administration has put an end to this deal. And a few, few weeks ago, we were asking ourselves, are there going to be any wars in the region, particularly after the killing of Soleimani in Iraq, and also the demands that are made by Iraqis for the departure of American forces from Iraqi soil. This also has led to so many concerns when it comes to protection by the U.S. That is why it is not a surprise when we see so many GCC countries are using harsh power in the Horn of Africa. We do see uh, military bases. We do see some islands that are supported uh, by GCC countries in addition to an Iranian presence and a Turkish presence in the Horn of Africa. And also the fact that the United States of America was not able to deal with the GCC crisis since 2017 till date. We have not seen a real dialogue. We have not seen a reflection of the demands uh, in addition to the Yemeni wars. Uh, wars. We have seen that some uh, American weapons uh, have been leaked to uh, extremist groups uh, in the region, and this is impacting the interests, whether on a geopolitical level or a strategic level. All these factors have led the GCC countries to expand uh, their visions, to expand their interests, uh, and uh, that is why they have started very much investing in the Horn of Africa. So the conflicts, the rifts in the GCC region have spilled over to the African countries. So these countries in the Horn of Africa, in addition to their historical issues and problems, we have seen that their issues have aggravated as a result of this spillover. So these problematics that we live today are not enable us, uh, enabling us to sit and discuss them and find solutions to them. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll try to hear or answer part of this question at least. Um, Again, just to reiterate, I think w what you've heard, I think from all of us, that there are uh, quite obviously risks and there has been destabilization, but there is also a huge potential upside uh, in each of these places. Let me just mention uh, about Ethiopia uh, and Sudan. As an example, I, I mentioned that there was a $3 billion uh, bailout package that, uh, that was really came at a critical moment in Ethiopia, um, as well as uh, the peace deal. Um, I agree with Rishid entirely. I think that deal 
uh, was wholly uh, or, or nearly wholly uh, driven by domestic politics inside Ethiopia. Now, the role of the Gulf was necessary and important, but insufficient, right? There was a deal. Uh, we will never know the terms of that deal, uh, it, certainly what, what Eritrea got, uh, but I think there was enough incentives on the ground on both sides uh, to want it uh, in any case. I, I, um, so the, the idea that that was brokered externally, again, I would caveat that. I, I think it's, there was an important role played by the Gulf, uh, and I think that's the kind of upside, uh, but isn't, it isn't the whole story. The backside of that is, um, I think what wasn't fully understood by some uh, in the Gulf was that uh, Ethiopia is a country that's been long ruled by Orthodox Christian Highlanders who have long been decidedly paranoid uh, about uh, encirclement uh, from the Islamic world, including from the Gulf, right? So when Abi got this cash uh, in Ethiopia and when he went to uh, ceremonies in Jeddah um, and in the UAE and this was celebrated, and rightly so, uh, there were also uh, a potential downside back home in Ethiopia, right? Questions were, well, is he now going to do the Saudis and the Emiratis bidding on the Nile Dam? What's he giving in exchange for the money, right? And so championing that and taking credit for that, uh, that rapprochement uh, also potentially put Abiy in a politically sensitive spot, right? So I think there has been some uh, there's also been a learning curve along the way uh, with this new engagement. On Sudan, uh, similar. Um, as our colleague mentioned, uh, Bashir, the, the now deposed dictator, was famously opportunist. He played all sides of the Gulf. Before there was a Gulf feud, he played Iran. He took a paycheck from wherever it would come, right? Uh, Bashir and the regime, uh, right up until it fell last year, uh, were seen most recently sort of in the camp, uh, and I, again, this is oversimplified, but in the camp of Qatar and Turkey. And so when he fell, uh, the other side of that rift, to include Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, moved remarkably quickly, right? Remarkably quickly in inserting themselves in that transition. Uh, many of us thought it was uh, potentially problematic uh, that Sudan was seen through the lens of Egypt, mistakenly. Uh, fortunately, again, uh, there's been some course correction and there's been uh, a kind of international effort to bring uh, all parties behind uh, the process in Sudan. And this is, this is maybe true everywhere. It's particularly true in, in Sudan. We're gonna need all international forces if there's any chance for a political transition to work in Sudan, right? There is no transition in Sudan without the Gulf, both sides of the Gulf, there is, who will have to provide uh, uh, capital injections uh, for this regime to survive. There is no transition without the Europeans and debt relief. There is no transition uh, without the Americans and lifting SST and offering some political legitimacy. So I think Sudan is, is maybe the one uh, most worthy of watching, that we avoided uh, the worst case scenario and, and fingers crossed if folks continue to roll in the right direction, uh, we may see this turn out positively. Okay, inshallah. Uh, let me give to the far corner, okay, and here, and, okay, okay, here. Sorry? Okay, no problem, let's, go ahead. Me? Okay, I'm, um, I'm Andy Parhams, I'm a strategist for Qatar Petroleum, um, and as a reward for my patience, I'm going to have two questions. First is the relationship between China on the one hand and the Gulf states on the other in, in this particular game. Do you see it as characterized by cooperation and cartelization or competition and conflict? In other words, the cartel model goes like this. We allow China the access to natural resources in Africa that it so craves, the opportunity to set up the next low-cost manufacturing center over time, and access to the consumer market of these 200 million people. That's what China gets. The Gulf states get a big stake in the distribution, the ports, the maritime business, the ability to play their strategic games against each other unfettered. Uh, what else do they get? Oh, access to, to economically attractive agriculture, which China doesn't care about, but the Gulf states, particularly Saudi, care very much about. So that's the cartel deal. They kind of carve out interests. Uh, and the competition one is obviously they, they conflict in all these areas. So which of those models do you think is the, the prevalent one? The second question is, why do Europe and US, why should they care at all about th this situation? 
I have three points I can think of. One is simple humanitarian concern. Yeah, can uh, you be quick? Yeah, so second, is, to... second is low cost shipping, instead of having to go around the Cape of Good Hope. And the third you just mentioned is getting their debts repaid. But is there a geostrategic reason why Europe and, and the state should actually care about this, this situation? Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any of the ladies, I will have a pass. Yeah, you will have, the, but first we'll, we'll give. Okay, no, no. Okay. <laughs> we have to put as many questions. Uh, okay, thank, go you. Ahead. thank you uh, for your distinguished guests for their presentation, which I, I, I disagree with some of it. Uh, let us say Can, that. Do you have question, though? No, Please. no, no, I want to, to make a comment. Please ask question. No, no, I don't. Uh, you can ask me, not I ask you. I am, I, am, uh, I am a politician, so I want to speak my point of view. If you let me, okay. If you don't let me, take your mic. Okay, give, it, give the mic that, yeah, please. Yeah, this is not, can you, this go ahead, is not go ahead. I'm just asking you to just ask question, please. That's all. Go ahead, give it to him. <clears throat> I'm asking you just to ask questions, that's all. All right. I'm asking. One more who came to comment. Okay, go ahead, please. <laughs> um, just a quick question. Um, how sustainable? We all, have, we all have strong views about this issue. How sustainable is this interaction? You know, like the Gulf, as the wealth situation changes, as the voice of the people, you know, uh, changes in both on both okay. banks. How sustainable are these phenomena that we are talking about? You know, the influence, whatever. Okay. Um, if you can just uh, elaborate. Uh, okay, there is a question up here. Please be brief in your questions so we can have as many questions as possible. Yeah, go ahead. Beth. Thank you very much. A very brief question. I'd be really interested to know the views of the panel um, with an emphasis on the geo as much as the political in terms of the impacts of uh, rivalry in the Horn of Africa um, regarding uh, the quest for food security, environmental impacts, and the impacts that that has actually for the indigenous populations of, of that part of the world. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Zach. Um, I'll start with uh, China and the Gulf for our patient colleague here. I'm gonna cheat and steal a line from an Emirati colleague who told me last week that the model uh, is uh, uh, coopetition uh, between China and the Gulf or China and the UAE in his case. Uh, and I think that's right, actually. Uh, I think this is still new, right? And so both sides are feeling, uh, feeling each other out. I think uh, the, ports, uh, the ports kind of game is a good example of this, not least in Djibouti. Uh, as we know, uh, the Emiratis had a port. Uh, we're, we're maintaining uh, what is a quite substantial port uh, in Djibouti. Uh, after a number of years of conflicts, uh, the Djiboutians uh, alleged, I think uh, fairly so, that that port was being underdeveloped. Uh, deliberately underdeveloped, right? Uh, so they changed, uh, broke contract, and, and signed up with the Chinese, uh, right? And, and uh, right after that happened, you saw the Emiratis not, not sort of go quietly, right? They raised this, uh, and a huge settlement uh, was awarded in their favor recently in London, which the Djiboutians are not going to be able to pay. So you have them challenging there. You also had uh, the Americans get very worried and very concerned about this, uh, given the Chinese take over that ports, whether or not that's uh, warranted, I think is, is a matter of debate. Uh, but but you've, seen, uh, you've seen in this ports, ports game, especially the Emiratis push back at the Chinese. At the same time, they are cooperating in other areas, right? They've given a new port concession to the Chinese at the port in Abu Dhabi. There are other places in the Horn where, uh, you know, maybe there's a pipeline uh, from Ethiopia's uh, new oil fields to Eritrea, uh, and, and the Gulf states might benefit from, from that. Maybe it goes to Djibouti. Uh, I think it, you know, it, it, it's not a problem yet. I think there's some healthy competition, some feeling each other out. 
Um, why this matters outside of the region, uh, I think it's huge. Uh, and I think uh, you can see that outside of, uh, I think, the Trump administration, which has been delinquent uh, on this uh, issue, this part of the world, uh, maybe among others. Uh, but you've certainly seen the Europeans, the big, uh, the Germans, others take a serious interest in this uh, because of the issue you mentioned. I mean, this is the lifeblood uh, of oil and goods to and from Europe. It's a huge issue. Migration is there. Uh, why have the Americans gotten interested and where are they interested? At the Pentagon. As I said, the ears have gone up there because uh, this is not only about the region. This is, as I think I mentioned, the western flank of a wider Indo-Pacific. Right, where global strategists believe uh, this century is going to be uh, competed, right? Uh, I think some would argue that the Chinese have seen that and, and that their presence in Djibouti fits in that larger landscape. Um, I think the Pentagon and Washington is struggling with that at the moment, but they are very concerned about maintenance of the global comments, about free flow of trade, about open sea lines of communication. Uh, if you go down the rabbit hole with them, they're even concerned about uh, the long-term potential for great conflict and what these key choke points, and this is really one of a handful, uh, really key choke points uh, that fits into that larger sort of great game. Um, I'll defer okay. on the others. Uh, can you be very brief? We can be questions if possible. Uh, no, I think um, Zach has, has summarized, uh, you know, very well some of the issues which I wanted to raise. Just two points, which is, uh, I think, there is a growing also backlash against China's model and China's investment which we need to highlight in this forum. Mm -hmm. um, especially in Kenya, where we saw how uh, the Kenyan government was actually forced to enter into uh, a deal that didn't serve it well. The SGR deal in which the Kenyans are beginning to pay now is now a huge destabilizing factor within Kenya's economy. Uh, Kenya is being asked to pay huge sums of money to the Chinese uh, for, the, for essentially um, a very old rail system. Uh, then I think we are beginning to see also the same similar pattern in Ethiopia. Ethiopia's uh, you know, light rail, but also the, the whole economic model of uh, huge debts uh, is also creating a lot of problems for, and there's big debate now in Africa uh, about the so-called uh, debt, uh, the Chinese debt uh, uh, you know, uh, diplomacy is causing uh, a lot of, I think, resentment among, among. Now, the Arab and I think the Middle Eastern powers are aware of those sensitivities. And this is why, actually, they are beginning to emphasize on win-win solutions, largely based on economic, uh, I think. Uh, uh, and this is where Berbera and these other ports infrastructure come. OK, I, I think I'll have time only for one question, I'm, I'm being told. So any, anybody? I just saw a hand somewhere. Anybody from here? And Mustafa? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you Quick very much. to the question, OK? And my name is Mustafa. I'm particularly interested about Somaliland. You mentioned about what happened between UAE and uh, D Djibouti. I was wondering, because Somaliland is like a special case, if there is a conflict between UAE and Somaliland, like what kind of mechanism is uh, like ready to resolve those kind of conflict? Because my land is not like, uh, recognized. Thank you very much. Uh, also, this is going to be your concluding remark, so we have about maximum minute or two. Yeah. Uh, you want to start, Khalt? I will leave this part to Rashid, but uh, mm. I would just like to comment again about uh, mm. China. Mm. And as seen, China is trying to come up with an equation in the GCC region, but I think that so far this equation is not successful when we follow the different uh, Chinese initiatives in Africa and the successes that have been achieved in those areas. Uh, maybe this has made some GCC countries wanting to enter into similar initiatives, uh, whether uh, with uh, uh, those countries in Africa or with uh, China in Africa. So there are so many old problematics that still rise to the surface. Uh, so the old uh, problematics and how China dealt with those countries uh, and how uh, Muslims are dealt with in China. This uh, 
impacts uh, the situation in uh, GCC, particularly when it comes to the public opinion. Perhaps governments have their own diverse agendas that try to concentrate particularly on the economy. But when we talk about the public opinion, there is uh, a very bad reputation. So China is notorious when it comes to the way it treats uh, Muslims. Uh, and also when it comes to the economy, there are differences because uh, GCC countries are still linked uh, to Western capitalism. And when it comes uh, to the banking sector in particular, and when it comes also to uh, adventures uh, that might be undertaken in terms of investment, whether in agriculture or in ports, uh, as it was presented by the other colleagues. So their opinions are not in keeping with the, the opinion of the Chinese in these particular matters. So when it comes to increasing cooperation to reinforcing relations with China, is something is still not very clear, particularly that there are so many problematics uh, uh, politically, socio, uh, 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 politically and uh, from a social perspective. Maliland on the port, but I will take him outside later and tell him more about it. <laughs> but uh, just because uh, this is going to be my wrapping up statement, I just want to concentrate on the positives and uh, the way forward. I think um, there is no doubt that uh, we, we live in an age where geopolitics is becoming hugely volatile. It's uh, potentially dangerous. Also, we live at a time when uh, we are, you know, major powers are retreating from the region, but also re reinserting themselves in more <laughs> problematic ways. Uh, and there is no rule, you know, rules are being made as we go along. And uh, the middle powers are beginning to find their feet. Um, and as I said, you know, these powers uh, do not want to drive conflict. They are sensitive to it. Uh, they want to put uh, their money where they think they can earn good investment from it. So they, they are very amenable to the idea of uh, a sort of a forum where they can discuss these issues. So I think conflict sensitivity, geopolitical uh, you know, actions which are conflict, uh, conflict sensitive uh, should be part of the agenda for organizations like Brookings uh, to, to also, uh, I think, um, um, popularize. I think another element which is quite important and very important in this is unless there is a multilateral mechanism for dialogue, for you know, both sides, the Africans, the African side, especially within IGAD, but also the, uh, you know, the GCC beginning to have dialogue, a multilateral uh, mechanism for dialogue, regular contacts, then these, these problems cannot be resolved and can actually spiral out of control. Uh, so those are the three elements I will really uh, highlight. Conflict sensitivity, uh, multilateralism, and maintained dialogue. Zach, uh, your minute. I'm going to apologize to those whose questions we won't get to. We'll, <laughs> we'll, like Rashid, we'll, we'll take it outside, he says. Yeah. Um, Can you respond I, to the Somaliland one particular? I'm going to actually respond to this gentleman's question right up front. Yeah, is yeah. this sustainable? Again, just a point of context, uh, this is still very new. Right in the grander sweep of things. I, I imagine many of you haven't been to a Red Sea meeting before, or if you have, it, it's, it's been recently, right? So uh, is this sustainable? Um, uh, I, I hope so, and I think, I think so. Again, I think there are, uh, in the short term, uh, two things. Uh, one, resolution of the GCC crisis, uh, the big obvious one. Um, there are different actors have, have, have been uh, more assertive or less assertive than others in this, uh, but there are no really clean hands. Every side has tried to score points on, on, on each other in the, in the horn, and I think a resolution of that would go a long way towards taking it down a notch. Uh, you've already seen that with the conflict dynamics change in Yemen uh, and the withdrawal there that there's been a, a sort of decrease in militarization in the Red Sea and on the Horn of Africa coast. I, I, I think that's kind of the obvious one. In the longer term, uh, I think it is uh, to make another plug for what Rashid said about this idea of a Red Sea Council or Red Sea Forum. Uh, again, it's been established uh, uh, on one side, and we've got to find a way to integrate the two. But again, um, and this goes to Beverly's question, 
uh, this is not just about conflict resolution. It's not just about large-scale geopolitics. There are opportunities here to talk about environmental conservation, to talk about flows of people, to talk about all sorts of things at, at multiple levels. And, and again, what is what is very new, um, uh, Afiari mentioned that you can go to both sides of the, these regions and you very often hear these kind of sentimental narratives about a shared history and a shared past. And there's obviously a long history there and some culture, but I think there's still quite a bit of misunderstanding. And I think uh, we in the West uh, aren't very good at understanding either region. Uh, there's quite a gap across what is a narrow body of water in terms of uh, understanding of each side's uh, politics and transitions of the moment, economies. Uh, and so again, I, I think this is the, the beginning. I am hopeful. Uh, but I think it'll be through that venue. On that optimistic note, I want to conclude uh, the session today, and I want to thank panelists, and I also want to thank you all for uh, participating in this event. I also wanted to make an announcement that there will be another BDC event next week on March 4, I think, is it? Yeah, on March 4, uh, on uh, transitional justice, is it? There are actually two events. One is uh, on transitional justice, and another one on, uh, I think, Tunisian. Uh, they have they have yeah. Okay. So uh, you have you can you can collect this, by the way, from outside. And thank you again for coming. And I'm so sorry if I didn't take your uh, question. Yes. I'm so sorry, I apologize. And maybe, by the way, they are here so they can uh, answer this. Uh, thank you very much again, and inshallah, we'll see you again. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.